This exhibit was inspired by my teenage daughter who joined the Fridays for Future youth movement and protested for global action on climate change for over 72 weeks. Watching her sit in front of the United Nations, rain or shine, because she perceived her future on this planet was at imminent risk, I decided to use my art to also try and bring attention to the issue. Drawing on the work of surrealist artists such as Magritte, Frida Kahlo, and Merit Oppenheim, I was also inspired by indigenous resistance to deforestation and extraction, as well as the climate activism of Greta Thunberg and Extinction Rebellion. This first painting is an oil painting called Wallpaper Jungle. I put a light switch on the painting itself because I wanted to make the comment that at the rate that we are cutting down jungles, there will be no more jungles in the future and they will only appear as wallpaper in people's homes. The alarming declines in the number of insects, mammals, birds, reptiles, and fish, as well as plant species have raised fears that we are in the midst of a sixth extinction which could cause a collapse of the natural ecosystems that we rely on to survive. Wallpaper Jungle was inspired by Elizabeth Colbert's book, The Sixth Extinction. The painting depicts some of the endangered plants and animals endemic to rainforests in Chiapas, Mexico. The jaguar, spider monkey, scarlet macaw, Central American tapir, and the white nun orchid. This is another oil painting called Rise and Root Farm. Rise and Root Farm is a small vegetable farm in upstate New York. I'd made several paintings on the farm over the years, but when I visited in September 2021, I was shocked to see that the crops were all withered and dying. The farm had recently been hit by Hurricane Ida. Rise and Root lost their tomato crop, their fall crops were severely damaged, and they needed a GoFundMe campaign to cover their losses. When I made this painting, which features two of the founders, I wanted to depict the farm in all its abundance and chose not to paint the devastated landscape I encountered. This is an example of how farmers are on the front line of climate change. This is another oil painting called School of Fish. And if you look closely, you might see that the School of Fish is in fact a school of skeletons. Because I wanted to draw attention to the fact that our oceans are in crisis and that the biggest threat facing oceans today is overfishing. The rise of industrial fishing, mostly for human consumption, has led to the harvesting of wildlife at rates too high for species to replace themselves. Today, over a third of global stocks are overfished, and that poses a threat to biodiversity and throws ecosystems dangerously out of balance. As an example, you might have read about the orcas on the West Coast. They're dying from starvation because their primary food source, king salmon, has been overfished. This painting was inspired by indigenous resistance to oil and gas pipelines in general, and in particular, the coastal gasoline pipeline on Wet'suwet'en lands in Canada. The coastal pipeline project was started in the summer of 2020 without the consent of the Wet'suwet'en people. And when they protested, they were harassed, intimidated, forcibly removed, and criminalized by the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, as well as the company's private security guards. This pipeline is projected to be 416 miles long, and despite the human rights abuses and ongoing protests, it's still being constructed. I made this painting to imagine the project being shut down, with nature reclaiming and healing the damaged forest. All right, and we're going to move over to another section of the gallery. It's a Saturday, so we have people in the gallery, which is lovely. 
Are you the artist? Well, this is, we're just on a Zoom. Yeah. Yeah. So this is called Rights of Nature. These are paintings that are dealing with the laws that recognize that ecosystems have the right to exist, to flourish, to regenerate their vital cycles, and to naturally evolve without human-caused disruption. Numerous countries, including Ecuador, Bolivia, New Zealand, India, and Mexico, have enacted laws that recognize the rights of nature. These laws empower ecosystems and species to have a voice in legal proceedings, allowing them to be represented and protected in court. The writing on these paintings was done by a friend, Kateri Walker, who is an Anishinaabe actress and activist. This one in particular is the Te Urawera Rainforest in New Zealand. This painting is of Mount Taranaki, which in 2017 was granted the same legal rights as a person. And under the new law, it gives the mountain the same legal protections as a member of the Maori. This is the Wanganui River in New Zealand, and it was the first river in the world to be recognized as a living entity with the legal rights of a person. An indivisible and living whole from the mountains to the sea is the quote from the New Zealand Parliament document. So these are a little more hopeful, hopeful that we can protect nature by giving it rights. So these paintings are where we start to see the influence of Magritte. You might know his painting, Ceci n'est pas une pipe, this is not a pipe. And so I use that surrealist concept of presenting something that is saying it is not that. And with a pipe, he was saying that this is not an actual pipe. It's a two-dimensional painting of a pipe. In this case, I wanted to take it a step further and say this was a forest and it is no longer a forest. And interestingly, I saw that Many of the markings that people make on both trees and animals is this fuchsia spray paint. So you'll see it in a number of these paintings. It just so happens that as many as 15 billion trees are cut down every year across the world. And this kind of forest loss and damage is a major contributor to global warming. Most deforestation is carried out to clear land for industrial meat production so that they can grow soy to feed livestock. As well as being uniquely beautiful, forests are home to more than half the world's land-based plants and animals and three quarters of all birds. We need to protect forests now more than ever. Okay, moving on. Here we have, this is not a pig, this is not a farm. This is really to depict intensive pig farming, also known as factory farming. And the pigs are literally spray painted with the same fuchsia paint as the trees. It's to mark them for breeding, to keep track of their ovulation that they use these markings. Sows selected for breeding are often confined in gestation crates that you'll see in the next painting. The crates do not allow the pig to turn around or lay down comfortably. The treatment of animals in factory farms is cruel and inhumane. Furthermore, there is growing consensus that ending meat consumption in the vast areas of land it requires is necessary to prevent the worst impacts of climate change. This painting was really hard to paint. It made me want to cry all the time because I couldn't believe that animals were being treated this way, especially very intelligent and social animals like pigs. Any animal, for that matter. They are just packed in. It really is a factory.
the surrealists do a lot of found objects and they make art out of them, so I started going to junk stores looking for things I could make into art. This is an old photograph from the 1920s. It's a woman and a child, and I wanted to look at what had happened to the planet over the last hundred years since this photograph was taken. Everything from the species that have gone extinct, the barrels of oil that have been extracted, to the acres of forest that have been cut down, and the gigatons of ice that have melted. So this is about industrial agriculture versus regenerative agriculture. At the moment, this is where the majority of our food comes from. These monoculture crops that are harvested with farm equipment that use fossil fuels, that poison the soil and the water with pesticides and chemical fertilizers, and emit carbon dioxide into the air. There's a big movement to transition to a more holistic way of farming. They call it agroecology, agroforestry. It's also called regenerative agriculture, even though that term is being co-opted. But basically, the idea is to have sustainable farming that restores soil and ecosystem health, addresses inequities, and leaves our land, waters, and climate in better shape for future generations. This one is called Suitcase to the Future. We've all seen and felt the consequences of rising temperatures over the last few years. Global warming is a threat to every species on this planet. And even though some of the changes are irreversible, some can be slowed and others reversed if we take action now. If you take a look through the mail slot, you can see what might happen if we turn things around. This wall is about greening our cities. By 2050, almost 70% of the global population will live in cities. That's 2.5 billion more people than today. So we need to transform our urban areas into healthy places to live by letting nature back in. We need more parks, more trees on our streets, more community gardens and rooftop farms. Greening our cities does more than improve the climate. It reduces flooding, pollution, and noise. It increases our well being and supports biodiversity. Community gardens and rooftop farms not only provide fresh, locally grown food, but offer a powerful vision for a more sustainable future. This painting is from an earlier show. Those are my daughters, Layla and Maria, on a rooftop farm in Greenpoint, Brooklyn, called Eagle Street Farm.
So this piece is called Communing with Trees. This is a 1928 Kellogg telephone, and that is a bonsai coming out of the top. The idea is that walking in nature is one of the most powerful ways to lower your anxiety, improve your mood, and boost your immune system. And in Japan, they do something called Shinrin Yoku, which means forest bathing. And so when you pick up the receiver, you actually hear the sound of the forest. The bird sounds, the bird calls, and you can hopefully lower your stress rate by listening to the telephone. Okay, and so the last two pieces were inspired by the surrealist Merritt Oppenheim, who made fur breakfast, which was a teacup and a saucer and a spoon covered in fur. I did a variation. This one is called Plastic Breakfast Number One. And it's a collage of tiny bits of trash that our family generated over a three month period. You know, a recent study estimates the average person might eat as much as five grams of micro and nanoplastics a week because it's in our food, it's in our fish, it's in our soil, it's in our plants. So I wanted to use ants that the surrealists used a lot, Dali among others, to show that not only are we eating plastics, but the microorganisms and the insects are eating plastic too. So I have the ants carrying the plastic food back to their homes to eat. Okay, and the last piece This is called Plastic Breakfast Number Two, and it was inspired by photographs of seabirds who have died from ingesting plastic that they think is food. 90% of seabirds are eating plastic, and because they can't digest it, it remains lodged in their stomach and it leads to starvation. Dead seabirds are often found with stomachs that are full of plastic waste, as well as other marine animals and fish that are also ingesting plastic. 